every time I try to grow garden. It's like every stink bug in town has gotten a personal invitation. And see the leaf for dead birds See them hovering I wish there was a poison That I could spray I wish there was something that would make every single bug go away And by go away But instead, I'm stuck with shame. All my leaves are filled with holes. All of my roots are chewed by voles. some poison that will make it all go away I will spray and 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 spray 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 <laughs> Another off the top of my head tune. Ah, oh, yeah, cold instant coffee. Coffee maker is at home, not in my office. So, therefore, I have cold tap water with instant coffee in it. thinking if I were <laughs> would somebody send me a super chat big enough to buy a second coffee machine that's just <laughs> that is so dumb but I want I want a Yeti cooler <clears throat> all right that's for you scrubland Avenger guys it's nice to see you all I, I, I YouTube has this YouTube has this new thing where they tell you when most of your views happen. And interestingly, most of the viewer activity is taking place around noon and at 9 o'clock at night. Well, 9 o'clock at night, I have to be out of this office. I can only stay here till 6. But around lunchtime, I'm here. So I said, well, all right, let's see if we pick up a few more people today, see how it goes. Um, you know, it's, if, if YouTube tells me something, I have to do whatever they say. It also says that 66% of you are male. And uh, judging by my past success with women, the other 33% <laughs> are pretending to be female. Um, how you guys doing? Let's see who's here. Leaf, oil science, Kamiyamini, what's up? Live streaming. Juan Acosta, hey, Kinjo51, Karen Hill. Karen Hill says can't hear yesterday's stream. I wonder why that is. Um, well, I didn't seem to have any trouble during the stream. Arkansas Woodcutter says, I'm trying to garden. Sewing for the future. Weird Steve Sogmiak. <laughs> Just put out a video about getting rid of disease with whey. Yeah, actually, um, the, the lactobacillus bacteria um, will, will often get rid of disease issues, interestingly enough. So he, he, he knows what he's doing. Weird Steve, though. That's good. 
Hey, Mrs. Woods. Hey, Connor. Cabbage mods hit me hard. Yeah, cabbage mods, man. Give me a poison. Let me push the button on the cabbage mods. <laughs> Gone. Danny says, happy Friday. And Ev, got the message. <laughs> Scott says, kill it. Kill it all with fire. Dan uh, Danny says, the deer are my biggest pest. They're really destroying my apple tree. We should talk about that. And, uh... Arkansas Woodcutter says, it's Food Forest Friday. Every Friday we update our progress. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> um, on your channel, if you have, if you have a channel and, and people are not subscribed to it, please drop it and uh, drop it into the comments and I will approve it because there's like a spam function thing that doesn't let links through sometimes. So if you, if you have a place where you're updating it, you know, we'd love to see it. Hey, Carolyn. Hey, Hugh. Can X Ray you. Harry Farmer. How to make pest and disease problems vanish. Don't plan anything. That's good. Sewing for the future, have I used some weird bacteria soup to kill fungus or pests? Possibly on accident. Black Hole Sun, hey, welcome back. Lisa Lee, and Vicky's here. Got a lot of folks here today. Oh my goodness, man. <laughs> Karen sends a $20 super chat. For the new coffee machine Yeeti Cooler Fund, you're just, you're just, I would, that was a joke. But thank you very much. I, I may have to just, I'll just have to buy one. Actually, it's gotten to the point, I have to tell you guys, it's gotten to the point where I have so many children, as the older ones have started drinking coffee, because, you know, what the parents do in moderation, the children take to excess, as a, uh, a guy once told me, which is totally ridiculous, but in the case of coffee, um, some of my older ones are now drinking coffee, and the coffee disappears really fast. I mean, I could drink half a pot myself, but then my wife is up most of the night with a baby, and so she could drink probably, uh, you know, at least a third of a pot, and then I have a teenage son that could drink three or four pots, no, not quite, but you'd think so by how fast his brain moves. Um, and then my, my daughter wanders around with a cup of coffee working in her flower garden, just like her daddy. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's pretty funny, but oil science, thank you very much. It's very generous of you. Oil science has a $75 super chat. Wow. You know what? I think I think we just about paid for the office. Um, the office rent is uh, three seventy-five a month, and I think through the last few um, streams, you guys have have made it worth it. So awesome! <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> Vicky says no one should have cold coffee. This is I, I'm gonna go get one. I'm gonna do it. Thank you. I will do it. Wish I could invite all you guys here in person to have coffee with me. But thank you very much. It's, God bless you. It's awesome. Unbelievable. I just can't believe you guys sometimes. Today, as it gets later in the year, it's interesting. If you ever watch, um, I don't know if any of you guys, you know, if you have your own, some of you I know have your own gardening channels. Some of you have had gardening blogs. The garden blogging thing has dropped off a lot in recent years. I used to really love going and, and looking at, other people's gardening blogs and doing a lot of reading online, but what's happened is a lot of them have just died or disappeared or they've become spammy sites or, or they haven't been updated in four years. Um, I mean, my site, thesurvivalgardener.com, is still going. Uh, I was posting daily for a long time, but now I'm down to about four times a week. <laughs> it's still going. I had a really hard time there when I had to go up the mountain um, and, and work through my phone. I, w I had to choose what I was going to do, and the, the blog fell behind. But you know, going to people's blogs and enjoying it, I noticed what, what happens is, particularly the further north you go, there's this huge drop off that happens later in the year. As it gets through summer, past the spring gardening season, there's a huge drop off in readership. Like, like the readership on my blog goes like this, saw up, down. So every spring it's like, whoop! Same thing with the YouTube channel, whoop! Gardening channel, everybody's looking up gardening, and then crash. By later in the year, boom. Like, YouTube revenue is in half, blog readership is in half or less. Boom, boom, there's this sawtooth thing. And so um, being able to do the, the live chats and stuff and have the regular channel membership is awesome. And speaking of the, the channel membership, uh, I am working very much on the um, unauthorized channel. I'm going to put my head over here. On the unauthorized, where, where is it? It's hard, it's like in reverse. 
No, that's not right. No, not that way. There! Freeze frame. I gotta make my hair stop moving. Um, the, there, right there. The, the uh, unauthorized.tv channel, it's subscribers only, and that is the, the best way to subscribe, to subscribe and, and support outside of the YouTube infrastructure, because we don't know how long all of this stuff is going to last. So um, we have an alternative server setup and everything that is basically demonetization proof. And uh, I have over 130 subscribers over there. I've got my house building videos and my long form Florida talks. And there's also other people you can watch over there, including Wrangler Star and comedian Owen Benjamin. And uh, there's Barcelona Life, where there's a there's this couple, successful retired couple, well maybe not retired. Um, they sure seem to party a lot. Uh, that that go around Barcelona and show off cool stuff and cook chicken, things like that. That I'm totally not interested in, but a lot of people are. So. It's kind of cool. It's like all these independent things and they're coming into this um, this non-YouTube setup at unauthorized.tv where people can do what they want without having to worry about being demonetized because it's a subscriber system. And there are in all the comments sections, which are, are very hard to moderate and maintain. But you can join me over there. Okay, so. For hardware cloth for chicken wire, Carolyn sends a chicken tunnels. Oh my gosh. The chicken tunnel man. Yeah, I really I really thought that was hilarious. <clears throat> um Shashka Kiela says gardening has exploded. Lots of people wanting to start a garden now. Yes, but there's a limited amount of time to get a garden started uh, at this point. Somebody asked me today if I would be interested in commenting on the folks that uh, created an autonomous district inside of Seattle. They have occupied the center of, of Seattle and, uh, and the police have retreated and just left it to them and they've got like this SoundCloud rapper that's become their warlord. I mean, it's, it's just like, it's like you can't even write sci-fi or dystopian fiction anymore. It's happening! But anyhow, um, they, they, they showed me a picture of the gardens that they're doing and they're like, this looks so dumb. But then somebody else said, no, that's, uh, this is over on Social Galactic. Somebody says, no, that's, that looks like David the Good style. And I'm like, yeah, look at that. Those anarchists are planting gardens like I would plant. <laughs> wow. So they've got, they've sheet mulched this area and they've dumped a bunch of stuff on the top of the ground and they've planted some things. I don't know. I don't know where they got the plants. It looks like they have transplants from somewhere. I don't know. They were probably brought in on helicopters from, from Russia, 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 or something like that. I don't know. But anyhow, I, I, I said, that looks like it'll work to me. I mean, I'm just a gardening guy. I'm not going to get into the politics of all that stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, hey, plant gardens, man. If you manage to take over six blocks of a city, um, plant gardens on it. Cool. I'm, I'm happy about that. Chaz, that's right. Um, it's not Lord of the Flies until they spear a pig. I do have a Patreon, yeah. If you look for David the Good on Patreon, you'll find me. Um, yeah, Good Gardening is on unauthorized.tv. <laughs> it is unauthorized.tv. All right, so let me see here. I want to make sure I didn't miss any any anything. All right, before we get into the topic today. <laughs> Make my pest and disease problems vanish. All right, so. <clears throat> what do you got here? Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Yep, that's it. Send Jack Broccoli to Seattle. Grow some turnips. Thank you, oil science. God bless, man. Have a, have a good rest of the day. I got this rash that's been going on for two weeks. What should I do, David the Good? <laughs> uh, <laughs> go buy some yogurt and put it on there. That'll get rid of it. A couple of days. Put yogurt on it regularly. The uh, lactobacillus will clean it out. Um, what do you got here? They got a cow. Good for them. <laughs> they're gonna get in a fight between the. Uh, they're gonna get in a fight between the vegans and the people that want steaks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get it. Let's get into this topic. 
I love it. I said a long time ago the United States was going to break into uh, into pieces. I didn't realize it would start with uh, six blocks of Seattle. Couldn't happen to a nicer city. Plenty of rain there. All right. So here we go. Let's talk about how to make your pest and disease problems disappear. The thing that most of us do when we garden is we say we want some lettuces, we want some tomatoes, we want some peppers, or we want garlic, cabbages, maybe carrots. You know, you start to do, you know, most of us don't start and say, you know, we want, um, we want to grow artichokes first or asparagus or whatever, but common vegetables. So we dig up a bed and we plant our beds in these common vegetables in nice neat rows. So let's say you've taken out an area of lawn and you've dug a garden. Maybe you went out and you bought some some borders for it and you start planting. Oh, I should say actual content starts here. I went to see David, David the good, oh yes. Hey, welcome back everybody. Actual content starts here. So guy that does actual content starts here. Bing! 16 minutes and something, I think. All right. So what most of us do when we start gardening is we have a lawn and we say, I'm going to put in a garden. So we take an area of the lawn out, we dig, we maybe put in a little bit of, um, you know, soil that we buy. Maybe go buy some miracle Grow dirt or something. And maybe we put up uh, a border on it. We've got our little raised beds. So we've, we've got a little garden area that we've torn out and we've planted. And we want beans and we want onions and we want some tomatoes and we want maybe some eggplant or whatever. So we plant these things and we plant them in nice little blocks. And so you've got your section of beans, you've got your section of carrots, you've got your section of um, whatever. So you've got your different, your different blocks. Now, because the previous ecosystem is a very undeveloped ecosystem, a lawn, we all know about beneficial insects. But if you think about beneficial insects, where do beneficial insects live when they're not in your garden being beneficial? Most of them do not live in a lawn. A lawn is a super low level ecosystem. It has very few checks and balances on it. It, it is a mono cropped area that has a super low level ecosystem. You may have some, you know, some worms beneath the ground. You may have some roving beetles that might do, you know, some, some, some bug hunting in there. You might have a couple of centipedes. You might get the occasional frog hopping through, but there's not really much space for anything to hang around. It's not an ecosystem with proper checks and balances. So what you do when you have a lawn and then you plant, say, a crop of cabbages, it's like you've got this big block of cabbages it's like you just hung a sign out that says, dinner time, dinner time, come to Carol's garden and help yourself to all you can eat. Cabbages nicely lined up in rows. Pest species are much faster to find gardens than prey species or, or predatory species are to come find them. So the pest species, many of them are, are designed with very accurate host plant spotting mechanisms. Um, they can sense and smell the exudates from specific plants and they will come from literally miles away to eat your cabbages or to eat your tomatoes. Those sphinx moths that lay the eggs that become hornworms, they can smell those tomatoes from a mile away and they show up in your garden. Now, if you have a wide open space, it's your garden in the middle of it, grass all around it, what you've just created is like a target. Womp, 
Come here. It's perfectly safe. There's nothing here that's going to get you. Boom! They come right in. They can sense it. They come in. Sorry, Connor, they're coming for your cabbages. So, when you don't have many checks and balances, you end up with a garden that has a lot of pest issues, very often. Now, sometimes you can get away with it the first year. The first year, uh, not everything has tuned into the fact that you are providing free dinner for everyone in the neighborhood. So you you can often get by, and you can often get by if you plant as early as possible in the year. Um, and then it's before the the pest species start to come out and and really cause trouble. Like I often grew my very best cabbages quite early in the season. I grew my best, you know, corn, the earliest I could get it planted. And, and sometimes it's, you know, it's a risk because the frosts would take the young plants. But the earliest I could get it going before the heat, before everything arrives, before all the insects start breeding and showing up um, was, was the, the best success I had. However, that doesn't last. A lot of times, once those, once those pest species have found your garden and started to move in, they often overwinter through somewhere in the area and then they come back again. And so people will say what you need to do is clean up your gardens completely, you know, destroy all of those old plants, rake the ground, bare the soil, you know, um, make sure that there's no place for any of those pests to hide over, over the season. And also, uh, you know, the conventional gardening says, you have a pest problem, it's time to spray. So you spray, you spray, you spray, you spray, you spray. You have to stay on top of it. You have to play God and play the, the predator because there is no ecosystem of checks and balances around those plants. Another thing that I think has carried over, or the same thing, has carried over into the organic movement is I will just spray an organic spray. Right, so this is for demonstration purposes. Uh, this is for medicinal use only. Okay, you see this? This is for medicinal use only. This is a very addictive substance. This is some of my homegrown and cured tobacco leaf. Right here. Tobacco makes its own insecticide. It doesn't work on everything. There are insects that can eat it. But on a lot of species, the nicotine inside of this right here will wipe out insects. So, you know, in my, in my one of my books, <clears throat> two of my books at least, I have my recipe for nicotine insecticide. You can go get some tobacco leaves. You could take some old cigar butts. You could take some pipe tobacco, whatever. You boil it and you make a, a thick brown tea out of it. You just make a, make a tea of, of nicotine and you put a couple of drops of soap in it when it's cooled off stir it around, put it in a sprayer. You can go out to your garden and spray the aphids and stuff with it. Now, the, the first day, the aphids don't usually die. You don't, I mean, they don't die right away. Like, you spray them and it's like, hey, they're still going. But they will die. Um, they, they kick off pretty fast with that stuff. The nicotine is strong and potent. So the, the organic people will say, well, we're just going to spray organically. We're going to use neem. We're going to use garlic. We're going to use hot peppers. You know, you've, you've probably heard of all these things. These things will drive it away or they'll be like, there's an essential oil for that. There's an essential oil. I like to use essential oils in my garden. And in my garden, I have, well, I have a blend of essential oils. I use thieves oil. I use uh, assassin's oil. I use, <laughs> you know, whatever. So they, they like, they have this, I, I need to make my own spray, but this is gonna be an organic spray but they're still spraying. Why? Because they have to play God in the garden because there's no, there's no checks and balances that are taking place. So the checks and balances, once they get in and they start running, um, will take care of a lot of those issues. But how do you get to the point where you have checks and balances? Well, I'll tell you, if you spray, if you spray, 
what often happens is by the time you notice the pest issue, you've noticed a pest issue and you've started to you're, you respond to it it's usually a, a while after the eggs have already been laid the nymphs have emerged or you know and, and, and it started to become a problem you spray at that point and usually there are predatory insects that have also noticed the problem and they're a little bit behind because the predatory insects have slower breeding cycles usually they're slower to establish and the the spraying that you do usually kills the larval forms or the eggs of the predatory species that are coming in from behind now in an annual garden you have a very short period of time for your plants to develop and do well before it's over. Annuals need to live fast and die young. If your annuals get stunted and they've got pest issues and things like that, you really only have a short period of time to fix it before it's too late. So sometimes if you want a yield, there is a necessity there where you have to spray it or you have to add chemical fertilizers or something like that because of the way the garden is designed. So a lot of people are survival gardening right now. They're trying to figure out how they can secure their, their food supply. You know, as they occupy blocks of downtown, you need to supply food, right? So you, you look at the system and you go, well, I've got a lawn, I'm gonna dig it up and I'm going to plant it. There's nothing wrong with doing that the first time. I don't even think there's anything wrong with going and getting seven dust or a chemical fertilizer if you're in a position where you just need food fast. Because in a, in a situation where you're trying to feed your family right away, or you're not sure how things are gonna go and you don't have enough calories and you don't have the learning curve and you see a bunch of pests show up, if you have a philosophy of, well, nature will take care of it, and you just let the stuff die, you don't get food. And you know that the food you've been getting from the store has stuff all over it anyways, right? And probably nastier than what you're spraying in your backyard. But that's not the ideal situation. You know, I mean, ideally, you're not stuck in a lifeboat and have to draw lots to see who gets eaten even though that happens occasionally and people live through it and they got food, that is, that is far from an ideal situation. Of course, that's way, way, way beyond you know, spraying your cabbages. But you know what I mean. It, it, there, there are extremity situations where you do something that is really not advisable. Uh, and then there are situations where you get a little more time to plan and a little more time to think and you create systems that work much better. So the first time you put a garden in, right? Maybe you have a little garden bed and you just use the hose and you go out there and you water it with the hose. Well, the next year, maybe you put in four more garden beds and then you're still watering with the hose. Well, the next year you're like, man, this watering with the hose thing takes way too much time. So you put in a couple of sprinkler heads, right? Problem solved. Now that, that would have been a great thing to do the first time you had a garden because it's so nice and easy, but you didn't do it then because you're, you're, you know, you're working up to it, right? So I will not say, oh, you have totally sinned against our mother, the earth, because you use 10, 10, 10 and seven dust and DDT and, and nuclear waste to get rid of the pests. No, you are forgiven. You just need to get food. You need to get food, you know, because it's what Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> You've got food. So you you that's not what i recommend and so you could t easily take me out of context and just take that little clip and say you know david the good says we could use nuclear waste on our gardens david the good is an evil man david the good should be called david the bad i hate him he's stupid and his hair is stupid and he doesn't look like one of the riders of rohan no matter how much he tries to grow it out and save gondor i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm not sorry Ideally, here's how you make the pest and disease problems disappear. So we've, we've covered a lot of the problems here. You don't have the ecosystem. You've got 
you know, your spray cycle is not necessarily matching up to when the predator cycles come in, but you need food quickly. You want food to produce well. You've planted a normal garden, you put it in blocks, you've got it out in your yard. Now, what I noticed was that when I first put gardens in at my land in North Florida, I had more issues. I had problems with cabbage moths. I had problems with uh, bud worms getting in and eating the, the tobacco seed pods on my tobacco. I had problems with, um, with hornworms showing up. I had serious problems with stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs. I had ridiculous amounts of disease issues in the gardens and pest issues in the gardens. I had, uh, I had the, the wilt you know, on my pumpkins and all kinds of stuff like that. That was the first year. It had been a weedy lawn, it got torn out and I started planting. But then, as I started to design my, my gardens more in line with permaculture principles and with, with, with a, a longer term ecosystem in mind, I planted a couple of beds of perennials right alongside my regular garden beds. Now, when you, when you think about perennials in, in the backyard, I'm, I, I'm not talking about planting a row of azaleas. There's nothing wrong with planting a couple of azaleas in the garden, but they're, if you plant a row of azaleas, then you've got another uh, you know, little monocrop of azaleas. Not like that. Here's what you do. There's a bunch of stuff you like. There's, 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 there's all kinds of cool plants that you like. There's lots of cuttings that can be shared with you from different people, different gardeners. Um, seeds, cuttings, you don't, you don't have to go out and spend a bunch of money to make this bed. But, but here's what I would encourage you to do. This was a big pest reliever in my gardens. So first, pick a bed somewhere in your gardens and say this is a perennial bed. And then plant a couple of small fruit trees in it, like apples like an apple or a pear or whatever, right? That's your, that's your high canopy. If you're in a more tropical climate, plant a banana or two. Now, these are just for extra food in the space, but it's also for a long-term hiding place, a source of leaf drop, and some, some nectar in the spring. I planted a pomegranate and a Japanese persimmon in mine. And then underneath, this is only a four foot wide bed, right? It was like a four foot by 12 foot bed planted at either end a little a little tree that I kept pruned. Underneath that, I planted goji berries, and I planted Mysore raspberries, and I planted a Caroline red raspberry. Around that, I planted a perennial marigold that I got from Heather. Oh, what is her? Um, I cannot remember her nursery name. I really need to plug her at some point. Um, the the marigolds are both a repellent and some plants like to live around them. I also had milkweed. I also had flowers. My daughter planted a few roses in there. She planted a variety of herbs. We had um, oxalis with its little pink blooms and the purple, it was a purple leaf oxalis. Um, there, were, there were probably 16 different species or so in there, a lot of which had blooms and growing on different layers. I actually had a chayote that grew up through the pomegranate as well. So you've got this perennial bed that is absolutely full of leaf cover. It's, it's giving you a yield. I was getting, you know, goji berries and um, raspberries of two different varieties. And then we got herbs out of it. We got some flowers that we could cut for the table. We also had the persimmons and the pomegranate never wanted to make anything, but I didn't, I didn't really care. Um, I don't know what it was, but it had a lot of leaf mass. So now you have this higher level ecosystem, which acts as a bunker for species that will then turn around and hunt the pests in your gardens. So lizards can hide in there, down in the bottom of the bed, underneath all those leaves and all that, that covered area, toads will hide in there. You can get little insect eating snakes. I'm sorry for those of you that are scared of snakes. There were ton, there's tons of space for beetles, praying mantises, stick bugs. There's a huge amount of you know, bees that are attracted to the system. And some of those bees are carnivorous. Some of those bees will hunt insects. Some of, the, some of them will pollinate and also hunt insects. There are wasps 
that will go to those blooms and that will also hunt for insects. And this bed is this, this spot of life that is in the middle of your garden and it is so beautiful to have a perennial bed in there so year round through the fall through the winter that area you're not tearing it up you're not stripping the soil you're not harvesting a bunch of junk out of it to make that space disappear both pest insects and predatory insects will live in there you have to have a certain amount of pest insects around or the predator insects go away so what you want is a balance between the pest and the predator insects. So the pest insects don't ever become a huge problem, but you haven't wiped them out completely with sprays because then the predator insects don't hang around. You constantly have to spray. So you have this really cool bunker of life where you have a higher level ecosystem, borderline like a forest edge ecosystem because it's only a narrow bed. And then you have your regular annual gardens around there. And what happens is, that area becomes a space for the, the life that comes and hunts and hunts through your garden at night and through the day and gets rid of your pest issues. Secondarily, I also put some stick and rock piles here and there around the edges of my gardens, just hiding spots for little creatures that want to come out hunting at night. Awesome. Some of the things we're scared of are voracious predators like snakes. Some people are scared of toads. I don't know why, but toads, frogs. Um, I also put in a small pond right at the edge of my gardens and the frogs would come in there and sing all night and make lots of little frog babies. And so I had frogs all through the garden. So now I've added all kinds of stuff, right? It wasn't enough. I also hung birdhouses over the garden, a birdhouse at either end of it, so the birds could go and make nests. Little, the little insect eating bird, you can design birdhouses according to whether they're cavity nesters or platform nesters, that sort of thing. And I, I, I made little ones for the little insect eating birds. Can't remember what they're called right now. Uh, Carolina Wren, I think it was. And they would, they would go in there and, and have, have little, raise little clutches of babies, and they would also hunt my gardens. But that wasn't enough. I also added Insect Hotel. I, I added a, uh, a, a box, an old wine box that hung on the fence over the garden. And I drilled a ton of holes and pieces of wood and I jammed them inside this wine box and put a little roof over it. And that hung there. So it was a dry spot with all these holes in the wood. And those holes were almost completely occupied by, by the middle of spring. They had all been glued in by various potter wasps and bees. And I saw all kinds of different species going in and out of there because I drilled holes of all different sizes. So different things came in there and they would go and hunt caterpillars in the garden, hunt stink bugs, hunt different pests, cram them into the holes, lay eggs on them, and then their babies would eat them. And then those babies would come out and they would hunt my garden as well. So after doing this for a couple of years, people would say, do you have any caterpillar problems? No, I actually don't. I didn't have caterpillar problems. Still had some issues with uh, stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs, but the way I beat the stink foot, you know, stink foot bugs was I, I actually planted a little earlier in the season, and they still weren't the problem they had been earlier on. Everything starts to balance out. And I also figured out, you know, once you get this ecosystem in place, you also mix up your crops inside of your, your beds. So if you have different layers of crops and different things growing around each other, this is not easy for those of you that are market gardeners or want to, want to do farming. There's a reason that a lot of stuff gets planted in banks. It's because harvest comes at the same time. It doesn't require you going out and grazing. If you have really consistent spacing all the way through, hoeing and plowing and all that stuff is, is much easier. But when you're talking a backyard garden space, if you can have a couple of carrots and then a tomato and then a few onions and then a, and then a cabbage and things are growing around each other and in each other, and maybe you've got a few perennials tucked in there and you throw a few flowers in there, it's, it's quite impressive uh, how the pest problems disappear and how sometimes you will see something really, you know, get getting destroyed like 
you know, one, one patch here, you see this mustard plant is completely and utterly covered with aphids. But four feet away, there's some more mustard growing and it's not even touched. They, they didn't jump easily. Whereas if they were side by side by side by side, the pest just choo, 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 they go right down the row and it becomes a much bigger issue because it's a buffet. But if you put something, you know, the, a lot of these pests are species specific. So if you're a species specific pest, you are not interested in, in carrots. So they repel you, you want mustard. So you have a bank of carrots, a few carrots in between you and the next mustard. You, you don't really go through there because all you smell is carrots. Blech. I want carrots. You know, all I have to do is put like um, one vegetable in my two-year-old's entire bowl. And he's like, huh. like, why are you going to make me eat this? Are you, you're, you know, terrible. So the ecosystem around the gardens, I, I think is, is highly important to making the pest issues disappear. And you may not be able to do it the first year, but I recommend you do it for the second year. Another way to really easily create more habitat that you didn't even have to work at is if you mow around your garden area a little bit, you know, so you, you have bank, you know, an empty area between the garden and the, the next bit that you can walk down like a path, but you just let an area around your garden just totally go to weeds. Like just let it get tall grass, let the wildflowers show up. The more species, the better. You could just leave a wild, unmowed area just a little ways from your garden, and a lot of predatory species will move into that area and will hang around there. So if you have more weeds around the edges of your gardens, it's actually really good. The, the main risk is that you have the weed seeds spreading into your gardens themselves. So I don't like, I don't, I don't like to let weeds grow in my gardens proper, except for the occasional edible one. I'm like, ah, you can stay there for a while. But otherwise, I, I don't like to, I don't like to do that, um, you know, right inside. But outside of the garden, if you have just like, they call them natural vegetative strips. And that's, uh, that's the agroforestry term for areas that are, are just allowed to stop erosion and to allow insects and things to move into them. Uh, you just let the, let the native vegetation grow in, in a strip somewhere near your gardens and they, the stuff will come in. The predators will come in and they'll find your gardens because the gardens are a good hunting ground for them. So mix up the species, create a lot of habitat. And now the last thing for dealing with pests is make sure that you are planting varieties that actually work with your climate. Stressed plants attract problems. And, and along with that stressed plant, uh, you know, fitting with your climate. If it doesn't fit with your climate, it's going to be under a lot of stress. It's difficult to grow. Bocking 14 comfrey did terrible for me in my Florida gardens, but somebody had a variety of comfrey that did really well in Florida that they, they had started. And so if I'm trying to grow this one thing and it doesn't really grow there, it's like the plants put out a distress signal and the distress signal is something like, hey insects, please kill me, I want to die. And, and the insects are like, wow, let's have a debate over euthanasia. And then the other insects are like, no, let's eat. So they, the insects will actually come and, and, and attack plants that are sickly. If you've ever noticed that, you know, some of your plants just never seem to really want to grow and then they always have bugs on them, they're stressed. So if you plant plants that actually work well with the climate, if you have a really hot, humid, nasty summer, and you try to grow beefsteak tomatoes. Sorry, everything's gonna come and eat them. They don't even want them to be there. You don't belong. Uh, if you have, you know, really, really sandy, scrubby area like some areas in Florida and South Carolina and elsewhere, there is some really just sandy scrub where the soil is like white, white sand with no nutrition in it. And you just try to pop in you know, plants that are grown in beautiful New England, rich, loamy clay, and you get seeds from a, a seed company that has been growing in these beautiful conditions, and you just try to grow them right there in the sand, they just get murdered. It's like everything in the world wants to come and eat them. 
you have to grow with with what works for the climate and also you have to make sure that the plants have enough nutrition and that the soil is built up if the soil is good and the nutrition is there right from the beginning you don't have to do these remedial things like oh shoot they all look yellow i'm gonna have to pour you know miracle grow on them you don't usually have to do that because you've already enriched the soil enough to begin with so the plants are, are suited to the climate and the soil is really good a lot of the pest problems disappear so there's your there's your dealing with pests diseases are a little more difficult diseases are also often linked to uh, a lack of of good soil but not always if you are healthy you are much much more able to run through you know a, a disease if you catch the flu and you're in generally in good shape you have a pretty nutrient-rich diet you know whatever you get the flu you don't feel so hot but it just rolls off you you'd be fine but if you were already on you know, dialysis you have heart disease diabetes and you get the flu you might die because it's just one thing too many and, and this, this is the way it works with a lot of the disease issues, is that the disease you see and you try to treat is just the very last thing that took them. They already aren't all that healthy. Um, you know, a, a lot of people, somebody said, one of you guys the other day, I don't remember if it was Natasha, said, you know, my, my cucumbers have just, you know, they, they, just are, they just succumb and they rot. Might not have been you, Natasha. I'm trying to remember who it was, but you know, if, if you're, if you, <laughs> if you try to, you know, try to get your cucumbers to grow through a hot and humid patch, it's done. It's it's like they they get all covered with that white mold, and sometimes the fruit will even rot right on the plant. This is what happened when my wife tried to grow the, the, the Z word, they rotted. They just, like, they just rotted on the plant and the plant got all kinds of disease issues, pest issues, and then they died. Of course, they also knew I hated them, so that, that didn't help. But they're not suited to the climate. So if you're in the South and you try to grow cucurbita pepo varieties, it's much harder to grow cucurbita peppos than it is to grow cucurbita machadas. So seminal pumpkin, butternut, uh, tan cheese pumpkins, those are machada varieties. Calabazas are often machada varieties. Those are from Central America. They're, they're used to the humidity and the bugs and the disease. You try to grow some of these touchy, you know, these pepo varieties that are, are fast, tender growth. They don't root much out of the stems, if at all. Some of them don't have any secondary roots. Uh, they, they just they just rot. They get down in the heat and they're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how you live here. It's horrible. Or it's more like, oh my gosh, it's so hot down here. I cannot stand it. I'm dying. I'm literally dying. No, seriously, I'm literally dying. I cannot. How do you people live in Florida? I know people retire here, but oh my gosh, I've just been sweating. I've, I've sweat through all my shirts. You know, that's what happens. They, they just can't take it. They, they come down from up north and they're like, Oh wow! Hey, you know, hey, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm just gonna go over here and die now, cause uh, you know, I'm from Ontario. Yo, know, so these varieties, they're not suited. They can't take it. They can't take it, eh? Done. I'm gonna drink my my cold coffee. Now that I have enough money for a coffee maker, thank you guys. I will buy a coffee maker. <laughs> I can't believe it. So, the disease issues are often a function of, of not being adapted to the climate combined with not, the comorbidities, you would say, comorbidities. We've learned all these fun words lately, haven't we? Like social distancing and comorbidities. And oh my gosh, we're all gonna die. So, what you do, if you wanna avoid the disease issues, is you plant varieties that grow with your climate and you plant them in really good soil. That's a big help. Now, there are times you cannot help the stress. You can't help the stress. 
the there's a plant that you really love that you really don't want anything to happen to you've transplanted it you get a week of rain and then you know a week of baking sun and then it gets stressed out you know it's it's br it's brutal in that case it's time for an intervention somebody sent me let me see here I think I still I still have a picture let's see if I can find this for you I will drop it in here we go one second <clears throat> I want to show you guys this because you you've probably seen this before. All right, I'm getting here. All right, so slow. I like to watch this David the Good navigate on his his computer. He's got a he's got a way about it. He just kind of he just navigates. And, uh, you know, we, we like to watch him. Sometimes I think maybe he's going a little... He takes his time. He doesn't... Uh, he does these impersonations I find personally annoying, but I think that some people, you know, might enjoy that. Where the heck did it go? All right, come on. Please, just... Please have mercy on me. Just, Just let me... Just let me do this thing for my live stream. I've got to show you guys this thing. All right, well, what the heck? I don't seem to have it. I had a really um, good picture sent to me today. Come on. You can open. Computer's really draggy. It always does this during a live stream. Draggy, draggy, drag. All right, never mind. So what he sent me was, actual content starts here. I just cut that part out. Um, what he sent me was, <laughs> David Biden. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I was watching one of his campaign commercials and I'm just, oh boy. We, we really, democracy really brings us the best of everybody, doesn't it? So, um, <laughs> So he sends me this picture of these spotted pear leaves and says, what can I do, you know, what can I do with these pears? And I'm, I'm looking and going, uh, I've seen this before. This often happens when the rain really starts falling. It leads to a condition in which pears are not happy. And unlike your annual gardens, pears are a long-term thing. Pears are, a, pears are a crop you want to keep around for a long term. If you get some, you know, an infestation on your, your mustard greens, that's no big deal. But if your pear has been in the ground for two years and it starts to get a viral, you know, or a bacterial, I'm not going to talk about viral yet. You have a bacterial disease, that really hurts because if you can push that thing through it, it's great. But if you have to sacrifice a $25 or $40 tree and, and lose a year or two of growing, that's a bad deal. You don't want that to happen. If you lose a pak choy, who cares? Chop it up and throw it in the compost. You know, you, you paid pennies for the seeds or maybe 50 cents for a transplant. Okay, it's not great, but who cares? But you don't want to lose your pear because it's got an issue. Maybe the soil isn't perfect. Maybe it had a bunch of stress. Maybe it's not ideally adapted to your climate, but by golly, you're going to intervene and you're going to make that thing work. So what I recommend in, in cases of you know, fungal issues and some of these bacterial issues and things is that you can go ahead and spray them to get them through it. Copper sulfate is really good for um, a lot of these fungal issues. You get these little fungal spots all over and, and, and that will knock it out. Copper sulfate is not that nasty. It's useful. Useful fungicide. Don't use too much of it. Use it according to the directions and don't drink it because it's it'll, it'll kill you. Maybe turn your blood green, I don't know. So you, you go ahead and you just spray it because you want it to get through. That's fine. Or you could do what, you know, Stefan Subkowiak does 
and say, I'm going to spray it with whey. You know, you're going to do the organic intervention. You'll use, uh, I've, I've had good luck using diluted kefir or yogurt in rainwater and spraying plants that have, uh, you know, leaf issues and stuff. It works. And I would say, you know, don't just let it die. But at the same time, I would also say, how can I make sure that this tree is stronger for next year? Sometimes if you overfeed, like you give, give a tree too much nitrogen, it will put on a bunch of lush growth really fast and it makes it really tasty to insects. When I gave my, a bunch of my citrus some fertilizer, like commercial fertilizer at the recommended application rates that the groves were doing it, holy moly, they grew really, really fast. But they also ended up with a lot of aphid issues and other, and other things. They grew fast, but then it brought in other issues because it was faster growth than the plant would normally you know, be able to do. So what you do is you feed that soil. You give them lots of micronutrients. You can give them kelp meal, azomite. Give them all your compost. Give them, give them a, a good layer of mulch so you've got a huge range of different fungi in the soil around them so that the fungi start to balance. Spray them if you need to spray them, but, but the more of an ecosystem around them, the healthier the soil, the less the diseases become a problem. And sometimes things just keep getting hit again and again and again, and you just say, that's it, I'm done, you're going down, and another plant is going to take your place. Somebody sent me a, you know, a picture of their mulberry tree with all these ring virus spots on the leaves, and I said, destroy it right now before it spreads. Just cut the tree down to the ground, you know, light it on fire, burn it, it's done. You don't want that to spread to the rest of your system. Some of these viral diseases you just can't get rid of. That, that sort of thing happens occasionally. But a lot of the bacterial and the fungal issues, you can, you can work your way through. I had pear trees in Tennessee and I had to do a serious intervention with fire blight because it started to spread. We had a long rainy season and, and the spring was really rainy and, and we got some spotting at the top and it started to spread down the tree. And that fire blight will spread its way into the middle of the tree and kill the tree if you don't intervene. So, a friend of mine came over and the two of us had our, our you know, alcohol out to sterilize the clippers and the saws and we cut our way through those. He just said, David, I'm gonna come over and help you. I know that's a big pain in the neck, I'll come over and help you. And the two of us, my friend Craig and I, we just went through there and we just cut and we cut and we cut and we cut and then I burned the branches and the tree grew out of it and survived and so far as i know they're still there last time i visited tennessee the trees look beautiful you have to do those interventions sometimes uh how do you know the difference between fungal and viral fungi often leave little little dark dark burn looking spots and they they often have like powdery little sections on them where they are making spores with viral infections, often you have blanked out areas of the leaves that are really weird, like in weird checker patterns uh, or in, in circle patterns where you might have like yellow circles on green leaves or weird designs running through it as the virus spreads through the capillary system and, and gets, gets into the plant. It looks very weird. The bacterial issues can take all kinds of forms. There are wilts and diebacks and, and other things, but the the virus is usually the easiest one to spot because it makes bizarre patterns. If you look up virus, virus damage leaf, you'll, you'll see what I mean. It's, it's very strange. So I am going to answer some, some questions here. That's, that's the how to make pests and disease problems vanish. Create habitat, first of all. Interplant different varieties. You can leave a bank of weeds growing. You can make a, a bed of perennials in your gardens with lots of insectary species. You know, your, your milkweeds, your various blooms. You could put in some food in there too, put a bunch of herbs in there. Plant flowers in your vegetable gardens. Put up bird houses, put up bee houses, wasp houses. Stop knocking the wasps down around your property because those wasps will really knock stuff out. They're really good caterpillar hunters. Uh, and then when it, it, make sure that you have the best soil possible. Make sure that you feed your plants as well as you can. 
make sure that uh, you are not just going out and spraying all the time and, and knocking things out because you often take out the predators as well. Don't worry so much when a few things die, just compost them. Make sure that your plants are adapted to the climate. Make sure that you are feeding and making your plants as healthy as possible so when a disease does hit, they can get through it, hopefully. And then intervene if you absolutely have to, but generally you really won't have, I mean, I had so few issues in North Florida after a few years of creating habitat, I didn't even worry about diseases and pests anymore. The only thing I killed and kept killing was fire ants. And that's just because they're from hell. So, I will take some questions. Uh, way up here, we had a question about deer. The best answer to deer is to exclude them with a fence. It will be worth it. The second best thing to do is to, uh, if you have dogs, the dogs will chase the deer away. I don't like to have to maintain dogs, and I find dogs will wreck your gardens a lot of the time unless you train them well. They tend to stomp on everything. But if you have a couple of dogs, they'll keep the deer away. So if you have dogs already, you know, keep them out at night where they can get the deer. And, uh, but the best thing to do is to exclude them from your gardens altogether. Let's see here. <clears throat> Canix Radio says, when to plant winter rye and tomato beds, frost in late October in Tennessee? Uh, I'm not sure. I would probably plant it in, in September. Brent sends a uh, $5 super chat and says, about a quarter of my five to six foot tall corn plants were knocked down by a storm. Is it worth trying to stake them? Yes. If you can get them to go back up, sometimes what you can do is, is uh, stick a couple of stakes up for support and then kind of make loose loops around batches of the corn so they kind of hold up together. So you don't have to like stake in every individual corn necessarily. Sometimes you can just put a couple of strings on stakes and, and prop them back up that way. Trying to stake every corn plant is, is really a pain in the neck. But this is a problem with corn, particularly if you have storms and, and wind. Sometimes people actually go by and, and put more soil around the base of all their corn later in the season, kind of plow through and push, push more dirt on it to, just in case there's a storm. But if you're not prone to normal wind, it's, it's too much work. But maybe put a, you know, a stake at either end of your corn bed and put a string on it, pull it real tight, you know, and make sure that corn goes back up inside there. It helps you have two people to do this you know, prop it back up. That would be my recommendation. I would try to, I would try to stake them. I wouldn't want to lose the yield if I could, if I could help it. Let's see. <clears throat> Chelsea says, pests and disease with the water pond too, please. I, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. TM Farm 2000 says, looking forward to the updated book. Will it be good for the tropics? Yes, because South Florida is in the tropics, and therefore I cover a lot of tropical species. It's not strictly tropical because there's uh, some subtropical, but uh, I know that people in Puerto Rico are already using my, my other books and some people through the Caribbean and Central America. I had a couple of different people tell me, oh, I was in such and such, and somebody had your book, you know, and they liked it. It's like, that's cool. <clears throat> Let's see. <laughs> Our gentleman says, I want to make a t-shirt that says, shovels don't kill grass, I kill grass. That's good. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> hey, Sunday Day, Sandy Toast, nice to see you. Kinjo51 says, I've been spraying a combo of peppermint oil with a touch of uh, suds, salse, salse, suds, into a spray bottle applied onto the tomatoes. This and those predatory wasps seem to be the winning combo. Good to hear. <laughs> Sorry for the future says, my garden was filled with bibinoid fly larva this year, and it's because I threw so much organic matter down that wasn't composted as mulch. Now my corn is suffering in the one bed. Yeah, that happens. There are times where mulching does not make sense. 
some climates and uh, some gardens, it does not make sense. You actually need to have that ground empty so you don't have the worst of the worst coming in. Larful says the ants always take care of the aphids. Yeah, if you eliminate the, the ants, actually the aphids go too, but generally I, I don't bother. I just uh, I just keep keep making space. I'm going to post a, a video very shortly here. I just finished a garden tour, 25 minutes going through the garden, so you can actually see how I'm intercropping and interrelating. It relates very well to today's, today's uh, stream. So you can watch that this afternoon. I'm going to put it up. Uh, probably be up by two o'clock, and I think I'll do a premiere. Why not? Maybe we'll, we can uh, we can talk it through as I, I play it. Do a live premiere. Yeah, Connor says scorched earth, burn down the garden so the pests can't have it. I like it. Is this where permaculture applies? Yes. Yay, seven, my hero. <laughs> The, our gentleman says, the best essential oil to deal with any pest is the fear juice given off by others of their kind dying. Collect this juice. Yeah, I was I um, was really tempted to nail some squirrels to, to trees out in my old food forest after they stole my peaches. I got a little sick. A little sick? Maybe. Laura Phil says, nuclear waste in the garden is called Godzilla gardening. That's good. I like it. I like it. You got something going there, kid. The natural enemy of moths is cats. I'm actually going to get a cat. Can you believe that? No, I'm not going to eat him. I mean, not until he's fat. No, I'm getting a cat to, uh, to deal with the, the mice that have been getting into my workshop. It's been insane. The mice have been breeding like crazy and showing up. And so I need a way to get rid of them. So a, a, we're getting a cat. The kids are utterly thrilled because, they, you know, when they ask for pets, I'm like, here's a cactus. You know, well, but daddy, I wanted a pet. Go, you can have a cabbage, you know. Daddy, I want a pet. Here's some dog fennel. <clears throat> oh, let's see. Dara says, how to chase voles. I have them under my straw. Uh, I would put in stick and rock piles here and there to attract snakes. Um, I have not dealt specifically with voles, however. Do you have a uh, you have a cat that might chase them? Sometimes, see again, sometimes when you put in a whole bunch of organic matter, you can end up with unforeseen problems. It really depends on the climate, the pests. There is not a one-size-all-fits solution for gardening. It just really isn't. Connor says mongo mongooses are the, or is it mongoose? Mongoose are the natural predators of voles. So get a mongoose. Ferret. That would do it, probably. Betty says we have five different fruit trees around where we're putting our new beds for fall. Do we need more? It will be near my established beds, too. That's good. I would plant different herbs and berries and flowers and insectary plants and just all kinds of stuff around the bases of those those uh, fruit trees to add an additional layer of habitat. I've noticed that the, the trees also do much better that way too. Hey, Mustard Seed from Michigan. Hey, one day at a time from Florida. See what we got here. I'm just kind of running through here. Okay, yeah, it's in the Grower Die book. There's a link to Grower Die below. That's got the nicotine insecticide recipe. Grower Die, the good guide to survival gardening. Um, I, I've got links to multiple books below this video as well as my unauthorized TV channel, which reminds me, guys. Okay, here's unauthorized, unauthorized.tv. That's where I'm putting the videos uh, that are not on YouTube including my, my house building videos, tiny house, expat living. And, but, but beyond that, I talked about that enough. I want you to see this. Whoa, look at that. That is by Michael. Um, Michael Head, who did this 
beautiful illustration of Aki. This is an illustration for the new uh, revised, expanded, massive second edition version of Create Your Own Florida Food Forest. If you are an artist, I am taking submissions for the book. The book is not going to make enough money to actually pay any artists, um, but I am going to give credit to any artist that feels like submitting. If you have an, uh, some artistic talent and you would like to submit a, uh, some art to the book, I, I, just, I just love this sort of thing. I've already got four artists, I think, that have, have signed up at this point, probably more now, that uh, are going to contribute. I need over 100 illustrations of different plants. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be fun to just have different artists do their own interpretations of these various plants? And so the book becomes not only this really in-depth guide for creating Florida food forest ecosystems, but it becomes an, an art book where you can look through and be like, oh, cool, that's Michael's. And oh, cool, that's, you know, my daughter submitted one for this. And my, you know, that's my, it's my, my son-in-law did a pen and ink for it. And, and, and there, hey, there's my, there's my drawing of this and the other thing. So I thought that's just so cool. I mean, it's, see, we can do these things that normal publishers can't do. I, I have an independent publisher that is so good with letting me do cool stuff. What publisher would ever have published Turned Earth, a Jack Broccoli novel? Now, I could have self-published it, but the publisher has the resources to lay out the, the book design and do the really cool covers and, and all this stuff. So we've got like pro-level publishing, but I could be totally artistic. I could be like, you know what? Hey, we'll get 20 different artists, 25 different artists, 30 different artists putting in drawings, black and white drawings, to this book. And, and so it's an art gallery of plants that grow in Florida, as well as being a really useful guide for somebody that wants to create a food forest in basically the subtropics. Now I know it's called Create Your Own Florida Food Forest, but it actually works for Southern California, it works for Puerto Rico, it would work all the way down to the equator because of the, the South Florida portions of it. So it's specifically Florida, but it's also, it's just, it's this labor of, of love. You know, the, the old version uh, is just 14,000 words. This one's going to, this one's going to surpass 60,000 words easily. So it'll be at least four times the size of the previous version with all the illustrations. And it'll be, it'll just be absolutely beautiful. And I, I have already done some of the illustrations for it. And I have illustrations that I completed previously, but with the different artistic styles going in there, you got different people doing it, it's just so cool, right? So I'm, I'm completely psyched about it. I think it's a really cool idea. And, and what I'll do is we'll have an artist's section in the book where anybody that has submitted a, a drawing, I'll put their website in and their, their name, and everybody gets credited next to their drawing. So it allows me to gather a whole bunch of, of cool art for the book, but it doesn't, like there's no way I could afford an illustrator for this book. Like it won't sell enough copies <laughs> necessarily to be actually worth doing it. I would just draw it all myself. And originally I was going to draw it all myself. It would have taken me months. But if I have 20 different people doing a few drawings each, boom, there we go. So, um, you know, there, there we go. <clears throat> if you guys are, are, if, if you are an artist or you're interested, um, email me, David at FloridaFoodForests.com. I have already assigned, I think, 10 illustrations so far to various people. So if you want to, if you want to jump in, if you want to do, it's black and white, and I will give credit to anybody that jumps in. So let me see here. Joe Guy says, hey Dave, how do you protect your squash stems from being chewed through? That is one of the worst. There is a, there is a pest called the, the vine borer, which is one of the, the very worst pests of squash. It tends to appear a little later in the season. Now, if you grow varieties of squash that root readily from the stems, so bush varieties, no, don't grow those. Uh, bush varieties, if you have vine borers, will just simply die because the bottom of them will get hit and they'll die and it's over, it's over, it's dead. 
Another thing is don't grow your squash on trellises because squash have this, they have bulkheads basically. They can root at each one of those nodes along, along the vine. So if they're that variety, you know, they crawl along the ground. Let them crawl along the ground and I would even throw a little more dirt over the nodes so they root faster. You know, if there's a lot of grass and stuff, you know, drop a, lay a little piece of stick on top of some of the pieces and just pour a little more dirt on the vines because they'll root wherever they're, the nodes are touching the ground. And this is very important to avoid the destruction because if a vine borer drills into the stem somewhere along there and the stem doesn't have any more roots in the ground, it will die from that point all the way to the end. But if the squash has grown part way and then it's and it gets drilled, but it's also grown into the ground in multiple spots, there's all this redundancy of different areas that have rooted down the vine, you won't even notice. Yeah, sure, it destroyed that piece of stem, but there's so many other roots on the vines that it survives. So really what it is, is trying to make sure that your squash vines root as much as possible along uh, as they grow. Make sure that they have areas that they can root into readily, and that's how I get around them. And some varieties are more resistant than others, like the Seminole Pumpkin is really resistant, and that's a good southern variety. Further north, there may be other varieties that are resistant. Um, but the, the, what you want to look for is squash varieties that really root readily along the stems, so you get that bulkhead approach. And don't let them climb bushes, don't let them climb the fence, because anytime they get hit, whatever area above that that doesn't have any roots, you will lose. It's dead. Chewed up. Uh, if you really are worried about a particular variety you're trying to save, you can also use neem oil and spray the, the, the lower area. It, they almost always hit them in the first couple of feet of vine. So you spray that area with neem oil like once a week, diluted neem oil, and the plant, apparently the plant actually takes the neem oil up into it and becomes less attractive to them. So, yeah, I think the, I think the book illustrations, uh, crowdsourcing the book illustrations, is just really cool because a lot of people can contribute and they're they're going to be commemorated forever, you know. And uh, I just think it's I just think it's so cool. Hey Scott, why? How did I miss the stream start? Yeah, analytics said that I should do it at at noon. Anyhow, guys, I'm going to run because I am going to post a video for you guys showing the garden tour. It's 25 minutes of walking around the garden with absolutely no edits. But it's me, so it can't be that boring, right? Just get your Dramamine first. It's going to be fun. And uh, you'll see what I'm talking about with defeating the pests and diseases, etc. Because uh, my gardens look like a complete and utter mess. And I don't really have that many pest problems right now. So, you guys have a great rest of the day. God bless. Be sure to check me out on unauthorized.tv where I am finally catching up and putting up all kinds of videos that I don't have on YouTube. That's an alternative to YouTube. Five bucks a month. And of course, if you are a channel member here, we also have members only chats and videos sometimes. So, you could subscribe. I want to especially thank uh, everyone. Um, for the, the super chats today. You guys are really, really generous. Um, and I wanna, I wanna thank Brant and Carolyn and Vicki, Oil Science, and uh, Karen Hill, and Danny. <laughs> Danny has kicked in five bucks for the office rent fund, so thank you very much. Yeah, if you guys are wondering why I'm not on top of a mountain anymore and why I actually have good quality video again and why I'm posting again, it's because I no longer have to climb up a mountain to use the internet. I rented an office space that I can use during the day for 375 US dollars a month. So I'm catching up, we're doing this thing again. And I'm, I'm working on writing my way through the, uh, the second edition of Create Your Own Florida Food Forest. And um, I gotta edit the next version of Jack Broccoli too, so it's coming soon, but I, I can finally get stuff done again. Anyhow, I'll catch y'all later. I'm going to post a new video in just a few minutes, so stay tuned for that. And I will catch you guys next time. And until then, may your thumbs 
always be green.